Okay, so let's start off by talking about the paper, and then we'll talk about the easy homework assignment. It, it wasn't easy? Oh, it was. It's for you. I haven't done it yet. We'll have to find out if it was easy or not. No, I, I know it's <coughs> very easy, really. It's something, but, yeah, I don't want to say anything. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, paper, write a two to three page paper discussing the stack data structure in terms of how it works, mm -hmm. what its three specific functions are, and how modern programming languages use a stack to implement recursion. Finally, give an example of a problem for which a stack is the right tool for the job. Okay, well, stack data structure. So last in, first out queue, correct? Mm -hmm. So it's like a stack of magazines. The last thing we put on will be the first thing we take off. That's the generalistic idea of what a stack is. Fine. What are the three functions that a stack supports? Pop, peek, and push. Push. Push, pop, peek. Push puts something onto the stack. Pop takes something off the stack. Peek lets us look at the top of the stack. Yep. Okay, so everything about a stack is done in terms of those three functions. With that in mind, and maybe part of the punchline of the homework assignment, because we decided last time that a tower is a stack, correct? Yeah. We have our, look at this guy. Here's our tower. This guy's a stack. He's a stack of disks in mm -hmm. this case. Okay. Well, we can pop something off that tower. We can push something onto that tower. Or we can just look at the top of the tower. A stack in and of itself is actually quite simplistic. There's nothing to a stack. So the complexity of a stack is how we can solve problems using stacks. Mm -hmm. And that was part of what you were looking at in this paper, coming up with uh, some of the, an example of a problem that's the, that the right tool for the job is a stack. Okay? And we'll talk about that here in a second. But a stack in and of itself is actually a very easy data structure. Very easy data structure. Okay, he's bringing Portillo's, so... We're going to let him off the hook for being late. Well, he's bringing me Portillo's. You get to watch me eat Portillo's. Not a problem. Your cup of slop there won't look anywhere near as good anymore. You see me up here with a chili dog. That's how I'm bringing just try. Well, I mean, I'd eat that. That's, I mean, I like that kind of crap, but I like chili dogs better. This is with the chia. Who? Chia pudding. Chia? Yeah, chia. You know what's chia? The harder it's your body. Seed, seed. Oh. Yeah. And, uh, like chia pets? Chia pudding. Chia, no, it's like chia seeds. Yeah, they're seeds. You know, they, they used to sell these things called chia pets. Yeah. You sure. plant those seeds into the thing and it like make things look like Homer Simpson and stuff like that. <laughs> and you're eating that in your pudding. <laughs> Obviously, you're bringing me to like, cleaner. Well, he's, no, he's probably does the same thing. Yes, but it's same. Organic, organic chia. Organic chia. Yeah, I'm, I'm cool with that. I'd eat that. Whenever I go to a restaurant that has something weird on the menu, I always order the weirdest thing. When I was uh, teaching a class at the Concordia Ann Arbor um, in Minnesota, uh, my counterpart up there, we went out for dinner the first night I was there. It was like a seminar thing I was teaching for a weekend. And we went to this, I know, some like very authentic Chinese restaurant. And they had um, a, some kind of anus on the, uh, the, the menu. Stir fried anus or something like that. So I had to order that. So. How do you like? Well, it was, I thought it tasted pretty good. I mean, it's only gross if you think about it. I mean, you're eating a chia pet. No, I'm eating chia seeds. Well, chia seeds come, I mean, it's like... Don't a you think about that, Dad. You're killing a baby chia pet. Mm. <laughs> All right. So in any case, the complexity of a stack is built into how we solve problems using stacks rather than stacks themselves. All right. So... Having said that, the next question was, uh, how do modern programming languages use stacks to implement recursion? 
What do we find out about that? So modern programming languages like Java or C Sharp or Objective C or C or C++, not Fortran. Interesting uh, factoid, a language called Fortran, uh, which is formula translation. It's a kind of a math-based programming language. It does not support recursion. It's just an interesting programming fact. Lisp, Python? Lisp? L-I-S-P? Yep. Well, that supports recursion. The, but I wanted to raise that it's not like... Not with a stack? Not like implements, not uses implementation of stack in their... Oh, that's possible. They don't use an implementation. That's possible. That's possible. But generally speaking, for our modern programming languages, how is a stack used for the implementation of recursion? Well, for starters, what's recursion? So for me to ask the question, how does it do something for the implementation of recursion, you have to first tell me what recursion is. Hopefully you all started with that concept. That would fall into the category of um, maybe like I don't suck as a student strategy or something like that. Like, you have to know what recursion is in order to answer a question about how something implements recursion, right? So what is recursion? Um, if I gave us a quiz right now asking what recursion is, would we do well on it? Yeah, just stop going. Mm. Recursion, you just stop over again. Uh, it does do stuff over again. Specifically, recursion does something over again in a very specific way. Maybe like um, this is like um, using the stack method to implement something and go backward. I think in I think we would have looked at recursion as an example of the factorial problem. So like five factorial is actually equal to five times four factorial. Four factorial is actually equal to four times three factorial. Three factorial is actually equal to three times two factorial. So recursion is when a function calls itself. Oh. Okay, that's what recursion is. It's when a function calls itself. So factorial is a good starting point for looking at recursion. You never emailed me the proper version of DevOps, by the way. Or the stuff that you, you didn't remind me. You said you would do it. Well, you did a nice text. So when I forget. Well, when you didn't receive it, that should have been a pretty clear message that you needed to remind me. It's your responsibility to remember. I, I, don't, I don't disagree. But the fact still remains it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. So it was a very clear reminder when it didn't happen that I, should, I, that I required reminding, whether or not I should have needed to be reminded or not. All right, recursion. This is where when a function calls itself from within itself. So an example would be something like 4 factorial. 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, right? Or 24. That's the final answer to that. Oh. But what's 4 factorial? 4 factorial is actually equal to 4 times 3 factorial. What's 3 factorial? 3 factorial is equal to 3 times 2 factorial. 2 factorial is equal to 2 times 1 factorial. 1 factorial is equal to 1. So we can write that factorial function like this. We come in here to, let me just go into driver real quick. I believe we did this in the 535 class. We usually do. Okay, so um, if I write something here, we'll just make this, uh, oh, it's inside disk. i got to go into driver real quick. Static int factorial int n. If n is equal to 1, return 1. 
otherwise return n times factorial n minus 1. That's a recursive definition of the factorial function. Mm. And I was, I was trying to make it, but it doesn't come out easy. It's really hard. I mean, I, I, I didn't do it in the driver, though, but I did it. In well, I mean, it's, it's not important that you wrote factorial. What's important is that you understood what recursion is in order to answer the question of how do stacks implement recursion. You get what I'm saying? So this is a recursive function. That is a function named factorial that indeed calls itself from within itself. The factorial of n is n times the factorial of n minus 1. That make sense? Until we finally get an n that is 1. And when we get to that, we end the recursive call, return 1. So punchline there is recursion is a function that calls itself, period. So then the question on the paper was, how do modern programming languages implement recursion? Here, I'll leave that up there. <coughs> how do modern programming languages implement recursion using a stack? Well, what does it mean to call something recursively? Well, it means we need to call the method again. If I passed in 4 here for n, is 4 equal to 1? No. So what are we going to return? We're going to return 4 times the factorial of 3. Can this method, this version of the method, end yet? No. We need to wait until we get the answer from this version of the method. Correct? So what we do is we take the entire component, everything about the current method, we push it onto a stack. So we package up the current method, all the values, like, okay, we have a method called factorial. The current value of n is 4. Um, the current program counter is, is, is on this line right here. We package all that up, and then we push it onto the stack so we can come back to it later. And then we make another call to factorial. And that one's the factorial of 3. Is 3 equal to 1? Nope. So we return 3 times factorial of 2. Well, we can't return this guy yet, so we package all this up. Throw it on top of the stack. So we just threw the factorial of 3 on top of the factorial of 4. Come into the factorial of 2. Throw that on top of the factorial of 3, which is on top of the factorial of 4. Come to the factorial of 1. Ah, oh, we finally got an answer. So once we got the answer for the factorial of 1, then we can answer the factorial of 2. So we pop that out the stack, get an answer. And once we have that answer, we can get the factorial of 3. Pop that out the stack, get an answer. And once we have the answer from that, we can get the factorial of 4. Pop it out the stack, there's our answer. That makes sense? That's how recursion is implemented using a stack in modern programming languages. And if you forget, the, if you forget to put the if n equal to 1? Then we'd have infinite recursion. You get a stack overflow. So let's just say we did this. Yeah, you're just going to keep calling it forever. And actually, it's, it's an interesting question because you'll see the, the, the proof is in the pun intended pudding. <laughs> So I'll do system.out.println driver.factorial of 4. Okay. And we're going to see that I get an exception. What's the exception I got? Stack overflow exception. Why did it show it like 20 times or something? Well, because, I mean, it literally kept calling it for n minus 1, n minus 1, n minus 1, over and over and over again until it got to... Let's call it negative 75 or something like that. And then finally decide, okay, I'm out of stack space. Uh, Java has a stack built into it, and it allocates X amount of memory, whatever X is, to that stack space. So that's when it ran out of memory for this very reason, so that we can throw an exception. <coughs> that makes sense? So there's your evidence that it's implemented using a stack because we never actually end the recursion. So this would be far worse than an infinite loop. Stacks are very memory inefficient. Recursion is memory inefficient. Because, I mean, even that small little example of calculating the factorial of 4 recursively, we had to package up three versions of this method. We'll, we'll call that, you know, a big bag of groceries. Not super light, right? 
we get a package of three versions of this method and put them on hold so we can come back and come back to it later. Now, not the end of the world, but let's say you were doing that thousands of times. That starts adding up pretty quick. You know, what's the size of a of packaging of a method? In this particular method, we're keeping track of one integer, a program counter, which is probably an integer. Um, this would be a very simple case because we don't have any local variables other than the one parameter. So we really only would need to keep on keep a hold of the name of it and two parameters. Um, so let's call this 30, let's call this 96 bytes of information. Let's round it to 100 bytes. So in a simple little method like this, we have 100 bytes of data. That can add up pretty quick, right? You might get to... 4,000 bytes of data pretty quickly, and that can get out of control relatively quickly. Yep. You know, 100 bytes isn't that big unless you have it a zillion times. But I'll round down. A zillion minus one. All right, does that make sense? How factorial works? But the important part there is factorial is a recursive function. And the question on the paper was... So I take it the answer to that question did not go well? Since we didn't know what recursion was? Okay, but did you tell me what recursion was? Okay, so your answer might be good. But he didn't know what recursion was, right? Have you heard of, have you heard of ghoul? I do, but the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's my best best friend. No, with everything. All right. So that's the recursive part. So last thing, give an example of a problem for which a stack is the right tool for the job. So there's a whole bunch of problems that exist out there. I suppose you could have said tower. Did I say you couldn't say towers of Hanoi? Yeah. You probably. You probably could have said Towers of Hanoi. So other than Towers of Hanoi, or I think I said recursion. You can't say recursion. So other than Towers of Hanoi and recursion, what would be a problem that a stack would lend itself to? You all, you all wrote about this. So t tell me, tell me what you said. Lots of problems out there that recursion uh, would lend its, or that I'm sorry, that uh, a stack would lend itself to. Give me an example of one. Obviously, recursion is one of them. Towers of Hanoi is another one. You had a problem from 535 that would have lent itself to a stack. What problem was that? Last homework assignment. A deck of cards? Isn't a deck of cards a stack? What else? What, what did you write? How many of you have ever heard of uh, a type of math? Uh, it's kind of built into the Hewlett-Packard calculator. That's where it became popularized. It's called reverse Polish notation. So if you had a Hewlett-Packard graphing calculator, there's actually apps for Hewlett-Packard calculators uh, on the mobile app stores. You would get something like um, when you put in your question, instead of saying, let's see, reverse... Polish notation. Instead of saying 2 plus 3, you would say plus 2, 3. That's reverse Polish notation. Okay? 
Um, actually, that's Polish notation. Reverse Polish is 2, 3, plus. Like that. Doesn't matter. They both would uh, lend themselves to recursion. What do I mean by that? So, if you're using a Hewlett Packard graphing calculator and you want to add two numbers, you would hit 2. You want to add 2 and 3 together. You would hit 2 and press Enter. Then you'd hit 3 and press Enter. Now, every single time you're putting in a number, it's pushing that number onto the stack. So we put in 2, it pushed it onto the stack. We put on 3, it pushed it on the stack. Then we put on plus. Plus fires that we need to process the current stack. So what do we do? We pop off the stack until we have all the numbers and add them together. Okay? So plus is an operation. All the numbers on the stack are what we're currently adding. So we could do something like this. We could say 2, 3, 4, 5, then plus. Correct? So I can say 2 enter, 3 enter, 4 enter, 5 enter. All those numbers would get put on the stack. Then I would hit plus and it would add the stack. Make sense? <coughs> For a long time, there was kind of a, a competition be between the... Um, Texas Instruments graphing calculators and the uh, Hewlett Packard graphing calculators. So, um, now, how many of you have a graphing calculator? Several people do, right? Or you've had one at some point in your life and they're all tech. You have a Texas Instrument one, right? Yeah. Uh, Texas Instruments won that battle, <laughs> uh, which, which is interesting because back when I was in school, um, uh, the... Ner the nerdy kids, they are the ones that had the Hewlett Packard ones. Like, oh, this is this is more sophisticated. So for us smart people, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that burned and died in the water. It was funny. Um, but it actually had a pretty complex programming language associated with it. So I'll just blame it on that. Um, but they were a lot more expensive, the Hewlett Packard graphing calculators. And they were a lot slower. And they were harder to use. So they had all that going for it. In any case, that would be an example of where a stack could be used for uh, mathematics. Anybody put anything else down for problems that lend itself, lend themselves to stacks? So I, I should keep my expectations low when it comes to these papers. Maybe we, we submit it. <laughs> but the more information. He had a week. All right. So that's the paper. Now let's go talk about the homework assignment. <coughs> so I gave you the starting point. So using our stack data structure for storing disk objects, implement the game The Towers of Hanoi for three disks and three columns, as simulated at the website that I already pulled up. Your program should use the scanner class for asking the user which column they are asking, uh, they are taking the disk from and which column they are adding the disk to. It should also enforce the rule that a larger disk cannot be placed on top of a smaller disk. Your program should detect when the goal is accomplished and display how many moves it took the user to complete. Make sense? Okay, how, how did this go? We all get it done? Easy? It was easy? You got it done? Yes, I did. Somehow. So, somehow. All right. So let's go and look at this. So this was the information I left you with. We have this class called Towers of Hanoi. Towers of Hanoi keeps track of a array of three tower objects. Okay? The first tower has three disks in it. The second tower has zero disks. The third tower has zero disks. So a tower object represents this state of the game. First tower has three disks. Second tower has zero. Third tower has zero. Make sense? All right. Now, So as of right now, we create our Towers of Hanoi. It should create our thing, and it looks correct. And uh, I did upload the new version of this. So if I make all three towers three, 
you should see that they all still line up fine. You could have reminded me. We already covered this. You could have done it in the first place. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, but then you would have gotten the wrong code. Actually, I had this out pretty quick. It was the first thing the next morning. I had the yeah, updated but you code. Didn't email it to me. You're right. I you forgot. Gave it to them. That's right. Well, I leave the, the, the harder problems to the smarter students. Mm -hmm. He needs all the help he can get. Thank you. Right? Yeah, yeah see? All right, so. Um, so that's what Towers of Hanoi is. It's a collection of towers. Wait, like you can email it to me in hours. <laughs> oh, like right now. Is anyone going to email this to me? Hello. I, I can email it to you. You want me to email it to you? Yes, please. That's what I just said. Oh, I, I thought you were talking about like in the past. No. Like now. Why All right. did I just bring it up again? I don't know. What's your, what's your email address? Lauren at abaconsulting.net. It's just like daddy's old email. All right. Yeah, it was like took like no time whatsoever. Great, so you could have done this last week. I absolutely could have with a quick text message. Yeah, or you could have done it because you said you were going to. That's absolutely correct. I cannot. Hold on, I didn't send yet. And you still haven't apologized yet. I'm not going to. Because it was your problem, not mine, right? But you were in the wrong for not doing what you said you were going to, and you have to apologize for forgetting. Because I'm not sorry about it. <laughs> that might be true as well. <laughs> All right. So, uh, that's what Towers of Hanoi is, that object. A tower has a collection of disks. How many disks? Num disk, number of disks. Each of these disks has a size associated with it. Okay, depending on how many disks it starts off with. What's a disk? A disk has a size, and that disk remembers its size. We can ask a disk what its size is, and we can also get the two-string version of a disk. And that was for the displaying purposes. All right, so that's the current state of our game. Now, when we run the program right now, we have our Towers of Annoy game that starts, which creates three towers. One of the towers, the far left one, has all the disks on it, three disks. The other two towers have zero disks on it. And it displays the current state of the board. So that's what uh, the Tower of Hanoi instance method display does. The next thing we want to do, remember our, all hard programs are made up, made up of a bunch of easy parts, is we want to go through and write the logic for moving a disk from a source tower to a destination tower. Right? or at least attempt to do that. So we're going to go into Towers of Hanoi, and we're going to create a... How do you open these things? Just double click it. Okay. It did, it created a folder. I did. Is no, it in I your... I have the folder, I don't know how to get it into Eclipse. Oh. Um, go into Eclipse. Here. Go into Eclipse, right click, say import, And then from file system, and then browse to the folder. Wait. What do you click after import? Where is this? File system. It's not. Right click out here. Yeah. Import shows up like this. Yeah. Right here it says file system. No, that's not weird. Uh, expand no. general. Oh. Sorry. Mine was already expanded. Then double click on file system okay. and then browse to wherever that folder is. Okay. All right. So, what was I talking about? Oh, all right. So, we want to write a method called move. And move will attempt to move a disk from one tower to a destination tower. Just drag and drop. I mean, yeah, that probably. Tried that, it didn't oh, it didn't work either? No. 
Well, what didn't work about it? It's not done. I can't click finish yet, and I don't know where to begin. Let me see. Uh, to give her my malaria. I think there's, you can't click finish yet. Sure, you know what you're doing. No, I don't. That's why I'm not asking you. I tried to drag and drop them, but all it did was put them up there, but it didn't put anything in the left column. Maybe I'll just put it in the nose pad and just send it to you. Just copy paste that. That might be easier. I'm going to have to do that. Yeah, I don't know why it's not working. It's probably just something. Well, you have. she has the files. Yeah, she just needs to copy them, copy the individual files into. I know. I just copy the All right. So we're going to write a method called move. And this method is going to return a Boolean. True if the move was successful, false if it was not. Because remember, successful moves means that we actually could get the disk to go from the source tower to the destination tower. But that's only going to work if the destination tower exists, the source tower exists, and the destination tower is a valid move. That is, we're not trying to put a disk on top of a smaller disk, a larger disk on top of a smaller disk. So we'll call this guy move. We're going to say int source, int dest. All right. Now, if source and dest are the same, we're wasting our time, right? Yeah. Or if source is less than zero, or source is greater than two, or if dest is less than zero, or if dest is greater than two, we're wasting our time. Correct? All those things mean this move was not valid. So if source is equal to dest, or source is less than zero, or dest is less than zero, or source is greater than two, or dest is greater than two. If any of those things are true, return false. So all these things are things that say we don't even need to check to see if it is a legal move. Mm -hmm. That is, we don't need to check to see if the disk we're trying to move is smaller than the disk we're putting on, on top of. <coughs> so if we're inside this else, we're going to try to move the disk. To try to move a disk, we must get the disk from the source tower and push the disk. We want, must pop the disk from the source tower and push the disk onto the destination tower. Correct? So we need to go back to our implementation of tower. So here's tower. A tower has some number of disks in it. The top of the tower will always be bucket zero. Okay? 
So bucket zero is where we put, well, actually, yes. Top of the tower is always bucket zero. So bucket zero is where we put the smallest disk. Bucket one is where we put the next smallest disk. Bucket two is where we put the next smallest disk. So we're going to keep an integer up here. So we're going to add another field to tower. Int cur top. This will keep track of the top of the stack. Now, an important thing to understand here, and this is where our curveball came in. Some of you messaged me with some questions. At least two people in here messaged me with questions regarding, hey, wait a minute. I thought we're doing stacks. Stacks are linked lists. What's with these arrays? Yeah, I do. Right? What's a stack? Last in, first out queue, right? Bus support, push, pop, and peak. Well, does anything about that say it has to be implemented with a linked list? No, the thing is... Yeah, uh, uh, we're using the stack expression like just we're moving object from the one tower to the other one. Because what you did in the class previous, you put on a stack, extend linked list. Well, and then, we did write a stack using a linked list. That's true. Yeah, I thought like this somehow connected with the, whatever we're doing. So. Yep, well, so and that's where the disconnect is. A stack in and of itself is not complex. We can make anything, well, not anything, we can make several things into functional stacks, correct? Just like you can make several things into functional baseball bats. You know, you can use a, you can go to a sporting goods store and buy a baseball bat, and that's your baseball bat. Or you can use a keyboard, and that becomes your baseball bat. It's not a, not a very good one, but it does function technically as a baseball bat, right? Um, so we don't always make things out of the same material. So we don't necessarily have to implement our stack using a linked list. When would we have to implement a stack using a linked list? See how much we've learned. This goes back to the argument of linked lists versus arrays. When we are creating implementation of like integers in the linked list. Okay, why? And you're arguing that we would have to do that as a linked list or as an array. The question is, is when would we have to implement a stack using a linked list versus an array? Or conversely, when would it be okay to implement a stack using an array instead of a linked list? Say this again. Okay. What do you mean by that? Inside in the okay, well, you can you can insert stuff into the front of an array, right? Or, or like we're using the stack if you're holding something and if you want to use for like some other operations. Uh, if you want to move the disk to the other tower, so yeah. Uh, Let's go a little more primitive with this question. Uh, we're going to go back to our paper that was due last class. <clears throat> what are the advantages and disadvantages of linked lists versus arrays? Forget about stacks. What, is link, what do linked lists have going for them? Uh, linked list uh, advantages of them? Sure. What's the advantage of a linked list? Because uh, linked list would give you like a huge integer you can just keep inside the very small amount of memory. You can put as many things on, you can add something yeah. in, where array has a set size. Okay. So now what you were saying with the linked list is that you were using our big, our huge integer as an example. Mm -hmm. We implemented huge integers using linked lists for a reason. The reason is we did not know how big we needed our integers to be. Since our integers could be arbitrary in size, mm -hmm. we had to use a linked list. Because you cannot create, when you use an array, you must tell it how many elements it can hold. That's a rule. In order to use an array to implement something, you need to know the worst case scenario. Towers of Hanoi, do we know 
the worst case scenario for any one of our towers? We know at worst, the most number of buckets any of our towers will ever hold is three. Okay. We have three towers and we have three discs. Worst case scenario is any of our three towers will have three discs in it at any point in time. No more. Potentially less. That makes sense? So it's okay to implement our stack in this case using an array because we know what the worst case is. We don't need to leave room for expansion. That makes sense? Yeah. All right. Yeah, what happens if you want to use <coughs> this, yeah, like n number of towers, uh, yeah, like n number of disks? Well, okay, if we're going to use n number of disks, then we could still use arrays because yeah. you can take n as a, as a parameter and build your array to be size n because that's the worst case. Yeah, like we are not mentioning any number of disks, just we want to use as many as the disks. Well, I mean, if you're doing the problem towers of Hanoi, when you start the game, you're going to have to say, this is how many disks I want. Just like uh, back here, you have a couple of choices down here. You can increase the number of disks. So when you start the game, you can say, oh, I want more disks. Yeah, more disks with the three, yeah, like three towers. Yeah, that we can able to do with the same. Oh, I, I got it. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay, so... You know, the point is that when you create the Towers of Hanoi, which our Towers of Hanoi object is a collection of three towers, we could pass into that that we want three disks or four disks or five disks. Yeah. And when we did that, what it would do, so we could have this constructor take in the number of disks. Then it could pass in, instead of three here, it would pass in the number of disks. It would pass in N, this value. So our code already works for that. Why? Because, well, actually it doesn't. We would have to say, have this guy taken a max disks. So each tower would have to know what's the maximum number of disks it can hold. Not how many tower, how many disks it starts off with. But the point is you could do this with arrays. Yeah, like what happens if you have only three towers and we have like n number of disks and the uh, uh, you have given the program like the disk with the smaller disk can't be on the like upper one. Well, no, I, I get what you're saying, but the, the point is is that you would know that, let's say the number, let's say N is six. We're going to have six disks. Yeah. You know that at the beginning of the Tower of Hanoi game, right? Right at the beginning of the game. And since you know that at the beginning, when we build our Tower of Hanoi, we could pass in that six here which would then allow us to get that six here. Then we could pass in that six here. We could write it that way. That makes sense? That would allow us to still use arrays, but because we're doing it at the beginning, we're creating the appropriate size array. We're not just saying it's an array of size three, it's an array of size N. Okay, so arrays are still fine for that because it's a fixed size for each tower. As opposed to an yeah. arbitrary size. There's not, yeah. I, I, okay, so that's the punchline here. The punchline is linked lists have nothing to do with stacks. Linked lists and arrays are the guys that are in competition. Sometimes an array is the right tool for the job. Sometimes linked lists are the right tool for the job. Yeah. Right? And something I said... Uh, not last class, but two classes ago, is don't view linked lists as, be, as being an upgrade to arrays. They're meant for solving different types of problems. That is, arrays work for problems that we know how many things we're going to store. If we know how many things we're going to store, as long as the number isn't ridiculously huge, where memory becomes a problem, arrays are faster. Therefore, they're better. Mm -hmm. But if we don't know how many things we're going we're to store, arrays are dangerous. Because we don't know how many times we're going to have to burn it down and start from scratch. Does that make sense? That's the question. We're talking about what kind of building material to use to build the house. Do we build the house out of wood or we build the house out of brick? Does that make sense? They're both viable building materials for houses. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> so nothing says we can't use arrays to implement a stack. What's a stack? It's something that supports push pop peak. Yep. Okay? So, our. Yeah, let me <coughs> unbreak some of my stuff here. 
All right. So we were inside move, just to recap here real quick. Here's all the reasons why we would immediately say that a move can't happen. Otherwise, we're going to try to make a move. To move, we're going to pop from the source and then try, I'll put that in caps, try to push onto dest. And by try, I mean we need to write our push method for a tower to check to make sure pushing is allowed here. That makes sense? So we're going to build the complexity of pushing and popping into the towers themselves. Because what's a tower? A tower is a stack. So we'll go back into tower. <coughs> and tower is going to keep track of the current top of the stack. Current top of the tower. So after we've filled up our tower, whether the tower is empty or the tower is full, Her top will start off as zero. Does that make sense? Her top will start off as zero. Always the top of the stack. Actually, could we do this a little differently? I think this would be better. Yeah, I like this. <clears throat> We're actually going to start cur top off at three. Okay, cur top is going to be off at three. Now, three is an illegal bucket, correct? Three is an illegal bucket of our. Uh, tower. We, a three bucket tower has bucket zero, one, two. Okay? So by starting it off at three, and then inside of this loop, we say cur top minus minus. So for the one that has three disks in it, we would go three, two, one, zero. Does that make sense? So whenever cur top is three, we know we're dealing with an empty tower. Whenever cur top is two, we know we're dealing with a tower with only one disk on it. Whenever cur top is one, we're dealing with a tower with two disks on it. Whenever cur top is zero, we're dealing with a tower that has three disks on it. So cur top tells us a lot about that tower. That makes sense? So in this case, the first state of our game, we have three towers. The first tower will have a cur top of zero. The other two will have a cur top of three. Okay, because they have no disks in them. All right, now, <coughs> well, I just said cur top equal to three, yeah, okay. and then inside my loop, I say cur top minus minus. Mm -hmm. sure. Now I'm going to write my push and pop methods. Pop, we're going to make the easy one. So pop is going to return a disk. What does pop do? It removes the top of a stack, right? What does that mean? It means return the disk at position cur top. Make sense? If cur top is equal to three, what does that mean? <laughs> That means it's empty. Cur top, if cur top is three, there's no disks here to return. Correct? That's the empty stack. Three is the empty stack. A two is the one stack. A one is the two stack. A zero is the three stack. Okay. That makes you sense? You change your... Okay. No, it's the same as I had right here when we talked about it up here. If I'm building a stack with three disks on it, I'll start cur top off at three, then three becomes two, one, zero. Okay. If I'm building a, a tower with zero disks in it, cur top starts off at three, 
stays three because we never go into that loop. We're not building any disks. So if curtop is equal to three, that means I have no disk to return. Therefore, I will return null. <coughs> Make sense? Otherwise, I want to return the disk at the current top of my stack. Okay. Well, the current top of my stack will be cur top. I could say, well, I could say return this dot the disks at bucket cur top. There's two problems with that. First problem, what's pop supposed to do? It returns it and removes it. Correct? Right now I'm returning it, but it's still on my stack. So I can't return it right away. I need to first remove it. So I'm going to say disk temp is equal to the disk at the top of the stack. Then I'm going to say cur top plus plus. So we're removing, so we can't go to the top minus one. We gotta go, you have to understand the way we're doing this. Right now, cur top of this guy is zero. Cur top of this guy is three. So this is zero, this is one, this is two, this is three. Three is below it. Three is the empty stack. Okay? When I pop off of this, Cur top is currently zero. It now just became one. Now it's one. Because the top of that stack is not at bucket zero. It's now at bucket one. If I pop again, now this guy just became zero. The top of that stack is at bucket zero. This is bucket, this, this is, um, well, this is bucket zero. This is, I'm sorry, is now at bucket uh, two. Zero, one, two. So it started off at zero, we added one to it, got us one. We added one to it, got us two. So we work our way down until we finally have. So right now, cur top is zero. Pop it, I'm sorry, cur top is two. I'm probably just confusing you more. Let me start over. <laughs> this is the way we currently have it written. Right now we have three stacks. This guy's cur top is zero. This guy right here. This guy's cur top is three. This guy's cur top is three. If I pop from here and push to here, this guy's cur top is now one. one. It's now one. It went from zero, used to be zero. Now it's one. This is a three bucket array. This is bucket zero right here. This is bucket one. This is bucket two. The current top is at zero, but when I remove that guy and put him someplace else, my current top is now at one. When I remove him and put him somewhere else, my current top is now at two. When I remove him and put him somewhere else, my current top is now off the end of the array. My array is out of bounds, illegal. Nothing in here to pop. Okay, and that's con consistent with this question right here. If current top is three... I have nothing to pop, so I'll give you nothing, okay? Otherwise, I'll take the I'll get the disk, then increment cur top, then Overwrite the disk that cur top with nothing, removing it. That makes sense? Then return temp. So I'll temporarily store it, update the top of my stack, remove, erase him from the stack, and then ultimately return the guy that I just erased, that I preserved inside of my variable called temp. That's what pop does. Make sense? What does peak do? Look. 
peak on the top. looks at the top. So peak is almost like pop. That is, well, if you try to peak at the empty stack, it's going to return null. Otherwise, we can return this dot the disks at bucket cur top. That's what peak is. Because we don't actually have to remove it. We're just letting them look at it. It's still on there. Make sense? So there's my... Is it necessary to use the peak? Like, you know, if I don't want the peak, just I can use the... Like, push over Not necessary. But remember, what stacks are is anything that implements push pop peak. So I'm going to give us those three abilities, and we're going to solve this problem in terms of those three abilities. We can choose not to use peak. Okay? We could certainly make it work without using peak. But I might decide, hey, why don't I peak at my source? Make sure it's really a disk. If it is really a disk, then why don't I peak at my destination and make sure the disk I'm trying to put there will go there? Could go that way, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, like we are using the three disks. <coughs> and uh, yeah, uh, once we are using the pop, we know like which disk is there into the tower one. So yes, we, we need to use the peak. Or, like, if you, you don't have to use peak. Yeah. You could choose not to use it. I'm just saying stack supports it. Yeah. So I'm giving us all three stack abilities, then we can choose how we want to use them to solve this problem. You could solve this problem without using peak, because what's a peak equal to? A peak is equal to a pop followed by a push. Couldn't we pop something off a stack, look at it, and push it right back on? Isn't that basically a peak? It's a mechanical peak, right? We actually removed it from the stack. We looked at it, said, oh, got it, <laughs> put it right back on there. That's a peak. But it actually was a pop followed by a push. Make sense? Okay. Then let's write our push. Public void. Um, I'm going to make this guy Boolean for right now. We might change that. We want, us to, we want him to let us know whether a push made sense. The reason we're going to write it as a boolean is because this is a special kind of stack. You can't just push anything onto the top of the stack. It has to meet a couple of requirements, right? So push is going to take a disk D as a parameter. And we are allowed to push that guy on under a couple of circumstances. If cur top is currently equal to 3, that means the stack is empty. Correct? If the stack is empty, can we go ahead and push it onto the stack? It doesn't, we have, I mean, no problem. It doesn't matter how big the disk I'm putting on there is. If I have an empty stack, I can put it in there. Right? Completely fair. I don't even need to check. If cur top is equal to 3, we're going to say cur top minus minus. We need to decrement first so that cur top is at the right position to two. Then we'll say this dot, the disks at bucket, cur top is equal to D. Does that make sense? else. So this first question says, am I looking at the empty stack? If I'm looking at the empty stack, I don't need to compare the size of the disks. So <clears throat> if I'm in this else, what do I need to do? Well, I know it's not the empty stack. Yeah, well, let me ask you another question. Is it possible that it's the full stack. If I, well, that's why I'm asking. Is it possible? This question says, is it the empty stack? I'm asking you, do I need to check to see if the stack is already full? Yes. Okay, tell me why you're wrong. Is there something that already asks if the stack is full? Mm, how? You, you can only make a stack full if 
It has to do with the nature of what we're creating. So I reset this. We have three towers, right? Each of our towers is capable of holding three discs, correct? If it's full, then that means that you have the bottom one and you're in the middle and the top one. Which means I couldn't be adding a disc. Yeah. There's only three discs. That's what it meant to say. So it's impossible for it to be full. If I'm calling push, I must not be dealing with a full tower because oh, yeah. I only have three discs. Mm -hmm. So if I've popped something from one place and I'm pushing it someplace else, there's got to be at least one spot for it. So I don't need to check for the full stack. <coughs> so that means that if it's not the empty stack, then it definitely has a disk at cur top. Correct? Now, I will allow that push to happen if the disk at cur top is larger mm -hmm. than the disk I'm trying to add. That makes sense? That is to say, if this is the disk at cur top and I'm trying to add this disk, I will not allow a push if this disk is larger than the disk at cur top. That's an illegal move. But if this is cur top and I'm trying to push this disk, as long as the disk I'm trying to push is smaller in size than the disk at cur top, it's a legal push. That makes sense? Now, by the way, up here, after we did the push, we can return true. Successfully pushed in our first if statement. If it was the empty stack, add it, push it. Done. Else, if D dot get size, the size of the disk we're trying to add is less than this dot, the disks, at bucket cur top dot get size. If the disk I am trying to add is smaller than the disk at the current top of the stack, then what will we do? Then we'll do this. Cur top minus minus this dot the disks at bucket cur top is equal to D, return true. Else, this says if it's not the empty stack, or I'm not allowed to put it on top of the disk that's there because it's an illegal move, then don't change cur top and return false. The move did not happen. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So this is our push. I've built our complexity of this problem into tower. We taught a tower how to pop. We taught a tower how to peak. We taught a tower how to push. So we can try to push a disk onto a tower, and it will tell us whether or not it worked. And we know that because of the logic we wrote, that it's going to tell us correctly. It'll return true when the push happened. It'll return false if it couldn't happen because it was an illegal move. And we happen to know, because of the nature of the problem we're solving, that the only way that problem could be illegal is if we were trying to put a larger disk on top of a smaller disk. That's the only possible way it could be illegal. Because we'll never not have space for it like we would have had in uh, Connect 4 from uh, the 535 class. You know, in that case, we could have too many checkers. So we couldn't, there might be a situation where we could not drop another one in. But in this case, we know there's room because of the nature of the problem we're solving. Okay? So this is how we push. <coughs> so back in Towers of Annoy. Move, int source, int destination. First question says, 
if this if we're wasting our time even trying to make the move return false. Otherwise, we're going to try to make the move. Now, Habib suggested that maybe we do this without peeking. I'm fine with that. It actually is consistent with what I wrote here. But we could do this with peeking, but yeah, screw it. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to say disk temp is equal to this dot the towers at bucket source dot pop. So what does this first line do? It goes to my source tower and it pops the disk off the top. Does that make sense? So I have physically removed a disk from the source tower or possibly gotten a null value if I popped from the empty stack. Now, we'll ask the question if temp is equal to null, that means my source tower was illegal. I said, remove something from a tower that didn't have any disks in it. Therefore, I'll return false here as well. And I'm safe doing that because if temp is null, I know that nothing changed with this tower. It was empty to begin with. So popping had no effect on it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'll try to remove the top disk. I'll check to make sure it's actually a disk. As long as it's actually a disk, now I'll try to push it onto my later tower. Go ahead. Why? Like, did you make disk temp um, this dot the towers and then you pop it? But say if temp was, never mind, I get it. OK. Just kidding. So we pop it, make sure it's really a disk. If it is really a disk, we're going to try to push it. So we're going to say this dot, the towers at bucket dest dot push temp. Now remember, our push function returns a Boolean, whether or not it worked. So now we can say if we successfully pushed it, if this guy is true, then return true. We made that move for you. Thank you. Move successful. Else, if this guy is not true, we don't want to just return false yet because you chose to do this without peeking. We have to push him back where he came from before we return false. Because we physically removed him right here. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we know he will successfully push back there. Because yeah. we popped him from there. So we know he got there somehow to begin with. So pushing him back there, we don't even need to check. Should have no ramifications. But before we just return false, we can't just say return false here. Because we have physically removed the disk and then just let it dissolve into oblivion. So we need to say this dot the towers at bucket source dot push temp. So if we could not put it onto our destination, then push it back onto the source, put it back where we got it, and then return false. <coughs> that makes sense? So all of our complexity is inside tower. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go into driver. Actually, I'm sorry, we're going to go into Towers of Hanoi. And we're going to build our little game loop that asks them for a source and a destination, tries to do the move, shows them the current state of the, uh, the board over and over again. And we should be able to see the fruits of our labor here. It's not going to count the moves yet. It's not going to... Uh, um, it's not going to know when we hit our destination, but it should show us those disks moving around because our display method is generic. It knows how to show the current state of our three towers given the current state of the three towers. Make sense? 
So we're going to go into Towers of Hanoi. We're going to write a method in here called play. And all play is going to do is it's going to create our scanner. for reading stuff in from the user. And for right now, we'll just put it in an infinite loop. While true, system.out.print, enter source. Actually, we probably want to show our display first. So we're going to say this dot display. Then we'll say enter source. We'll read in int source is equal to input dot next int. Or you could have said integer dot parse int input dot next line. Either of those is fine. Now, we have to create for now we'll ask for the destination. And we can assume they're going to put in numbers. Okay, then we're going to say this dot move <coughs> source and dest. We'll do that over and over again right now. We're not going to give them any input uh, saying, hey, it was an illegal move, other than they'll see the board did not change. Okay, this should allow us to test our move method. We should be able to move disks around legal positions. All right, so back out in driver. I'll go back in a second. Back out in driver. We're going to say toh dot play. play. And when we run this, we should now be in an infinite loop where it's going to keep asking us for source and destination. Oh, we're actually displaying twice. Let's not be stupid. There. Displaying once, enter source. So we're going to choose one. We're going to remove from stack one. Actually, we're removing from stack zero. Zero based, right? Remove from stack zero. Enter stack one. Okay? So remove from stack zero, put on to stack one. Now we're going to say remove from stack. Actually, hold on. Like when it goes up, no, the wrong guy got removed. Yep. That's why I couldn't finish this game. I put a bug in there. We have to look at our pop. Our pop is broken. You wrote a bad pop. Oh. <laughs> we have a bug in pop. We incremented cur top before we zeroed it out. I was testing you. So, get it, zero it out, then increment it. Make sense? Now we'll do source zero to one. Okay. No, this guy's not quite centered. That's fine. Just deal. Um, then we'll say uh, zero to one again, it should not allow this. So we should see the same state of the board again. Okay. Now we'll say zero to two. It should allow this. So we should see this disk move to here. And we should see one disk per. It'll look good in the end. I didn't quite think through my display method from the, uh, what if it's showing just a, a small disk on the bottom, but just, we know what's going on. It's good enough. All right. Now we're going to put from one onto two. Then we'll put from zero to one. 
Then we'll put 2 to 0. Then we'll put 2 to 1. Just, see, look how, look how good my display method is looking. That was my upgraded version. <laughs> hey, it looks good when it's complete. Then we'll do 0 to 2. Then we'll go 1 to 0. Then we'll go 2 to 0. Then we'll go 1 to 2. Then we'll go 0 to 1. 0 to 2. 1 to 2. Make sense? Yeah, it looks pretty now. Got a little bit zigzaggy, but we could see where everything was. Everything was relative to each other, okay. So I'll give myself like a C plus for the display method. But I wrote your display method, so I won't hold that against you. I'll hold it against you a little bit. And that's not why you didn't get this working. The display method worked well enough to write this. All right. So our move method seems to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. Can you go back to challenge scenario? Let's see. Which method play? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so the way we've gone about solving this problem so far is keeping track. Well, we've built all of our complexity into the stack data structure that is our tower. And we just tested it. We can move disks all over the place, right? Now, to complete the assignment, all we have to do is, A, count the number of times that move was successful. Well, that's easy enough, isn't it? That's inside play. Int count starts off at zero. Here's where we do our move. If this is true, if we successfully moved, count plus plus. Right? So when we finally break out of this loop, we'll say system.out.println winner. It took count number of moves. There's something wrong there. What's it complaining about? Oh, unreachable code. Yeah, it's because we're still in an infinite loop. That's fine. We're going to break out of that. All right. So this is correctly written. It's just a line of code we can never reach because this is a this is a infinite loop. Mm -hmm. But we're going to have a break in here. You'll see if I have a break like this, he no longer complains. Okay. Now, when have I reached my goal? At what point do I know we have a winner? At the end, when, when there's a bucket two spawn? No, bucket three. When our tower at bucket two. Yeah. Yeah, so when our tower at bucket two, mm -hmm. this guy, when he is full, what does it mean for him to be full? How do we detect is he full? Okay. Equal to three. Other way. It's related to Kurt top. You said cur top is equal to three. No, zero. But it's equal to zero. Three means it's empty. Okay. Right? When cur top is zero, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. full. So what we're going to do is we're just going to add to our tower. A method. Public boolean is full. And this guy will say if... Well, actually, we need an if. We'll just say return cur top equal equal to zero. If cur top is equal to zero, it's full. Return true. If it's not equal to zero, false. It's not full. 
right? So there's his fall. How long are we going to run this loop? As long as this dot, the towers at bucket two dot is full is equal to false. Or probably more correctly, while not tower two is full. Same thing. So while tower two is not full, keep asking the questions and keep counting. Make sense? All right, so we're going to go from zero to two, zero to one, two to one, zero to two, one to zero, one to two, zero to two. There's our winner. It took seven moves. Yep. <clears throat> Probably should have displayed it one more time for the prettiness factor. Here, we'll call that the completely done solution. So let's do that one more time. Zero, two, two. Zero, two, one. Two to one. Zero to two. 1 to 0, 1 to 2, 0 to 2. Make sense? So I think that, does that successfully answer the question? Yeah. Easier or harder than you thought? Hopefully a lot easier than you thought. Yeah, it was, yeah. Like I, I was having a lot of issues with the putting the stuff in mm -hmm. place. Course. Well, that's the point. I mean, you're supposed to struggle with it. Yeah. But understand that we put all the complexity into the push, pop, and peak methods. And we ended up not even using peak. So we could have omitted that. But the reality is, is you know, pop, peak were trivial. So almost all of our complexity here was in whether or not a disk could be pushed. Right? Yep. All of it. All right, questions about this? <coughs> so let me ask you this. What if you had to write a solver for this, a robot, okay. if you will, that solved uh, this puzzle, solved Towers of Hanoi, in the least number of spots. That is, we need to create an algorithm for doing Towers of Hanoi. How would we do that? Well, first, we need to solve the problem. If I run this, and it currently looks like this, how do I know that the correct first move is to move this disk from here to here? There has to be an algorithm that we could always solve the Tower of Hanoi problem perfectly. Well, we could move it in either one, yeah. but why is it correct to move it here? It is correct to move it here. By moving it, if I move it to this middle one, it will take me more than seven moves. Uh, yeah, we are coming from uh, disk one is the uh, 
uh, smaller end, so we are moving into the last tower, and this two is into the uh, or tower two. Okay, so you're saying if we're dealing with the smallest disk, yeah. the disk we're moving is the smallest disk, yeah. then move it to the farthest tower, yeah. to tower two? Okay. Because this is the smallest disk, I'm going to move this to tower, tower two. Now, remember, we're going to have to repeat this algorithm over and over again. So we're going to see if this works out. So, since it's the smallest disk, we're going to go from zero to two. Okay? Now, it's the smallest disk. Now, what am I going to do next? Next smallest disk would be the to uh, one. Zero to one. Well, how did you choose to even start with this tower? Before, we started with zero because that's where the disks were. All the disks were on tower zero. It was our only choice. But now, I could choose from two towers. Why did I choose this tower? Just one. Don't choose where we just pushed. And you're just undoing a turn, right? Yeah. Okay. So because we just moved here, our only other choice is here. So we're going to push our pop here, and we're looking at this disc. Where do we put this guy? Uh, one. Why? Because it's bigger it's than two, bigger than small. It's the only place we can yeah. put it. Only. Okay. Isn't that the only move we can make right now? Yeah. yeah. That doesn't involve doing what we did before, moving it. Right? So the only move we can make right now is from this tower, and the only legal move from this tower is to go to this tower. Zero to one. Okay? Now what? Now, now I have two legal moves. I can either choose this guy, or I can choose this guy. I can't choose this one because our algorithm says we can't go back to where we just moved. Bye. True or false, you cannot move the bigger one onto the smaller disks. So that's why you have to choose smaller one onto the bigger. And we cannot choose whatever we choose before. So that means like the smallest one on the bucket two, on power two. Okay, so because my two legal moves are this, I can choose to move this guy or I could choose to move this guy. If I move this guy, I have nowhere to put him. So I have to move the smallest one. And where will I move the smallest one? Why? I agree. But there's got to be a why. You have two. I can, we've decided we're going to move this guy. Why? Because this move, well, we can't make this move. We can't move this guy right now. So we're going to move this guy. I can move him either here or I can move him here. Why will I choose to move him here? Uh, uh, we have to uh, move uh, large disk into uh, tower two. See, we're seeing an interesting point here. We all know yeah. that the correct move to make is to make this one go here, right? The question is, is why do we know? Somewhere inside of our mind, we solved this problem, but we don't know why we solved it. We don't know how we solved it. We just know it's the correct move to move this guy from here to here. No, you know, because if we put it on top of the other one, you're in, we just moved the second one, and then we have to move it again. So that kind of doesn't make any sense for you. Well, but it still follows in with our algorithm, where if I move this guy to go on top of here, then it's legal for me to move this guy here. Yeah. Because it wasn't just the previous move. I, I agree, it's a stupid move. But, but then again, why do we know it's a stupid yeah. move? It goes back to how human beings are so good at solving problems that we don't even know we're doing it. <laughs> we're seeing it in action here, right? Plus, yeah. You know, this is like those magic shows where, you know, the guy's like saying, you know, okay, which hand is it in? Like, it's not, you know, whatever. You know, he just tricks you. We all know the correct answers. We're seeing it, but we don't know why. We can do yeah. that. Just, just we need to be increase the two or three steps again. Like we move back to this uh, uh, one <coughs> to tower two and this three to two. So we are just we are increasing the steps. So we are then to... we have to just look the tower in the middle like a helper, like to move the main tower, like main big uh, 
disc into the third tower, which is the aim of the moving it. Okay. Let me ask you this question. As we go through here, will we ever put the smallest disc on top of the largest disc? No. Never, Never happens. Mm -hmm. Does that have to do with our algorithm, possibly? Right now, we can move this guy from here to here or from here to here. Why would we not move him here? Because this guy's the smallest and this guy's the largest. And we're never going to move the smallest on top of the largest. I don't know why, but we just made that rule. Okay? So we'll go with it. Fine. So we're going to go from 2 to 1. Now, I can't make a move here because there's no disk. I can't make a move here because that's the move I just made. So now I'm going to make this move. And where am I going to put this guy? On the empty. On the empty tower. The only place I can move him. Right? Not allowed to move him here. So we're going to go from zero to two. Now, I can't make this move over here because I just made that move. That's off limits. I can't make a move here because there's no disks. So I'm definitely moving from here. Am I going to put him here, or am I going to put him here? We created a rule that we cannot move the... Not allowed to put him on top of the biggest guy. Yep. So we're going to go from 1 to 0. Okay? Now, I can't make this move because we just moved it. So my two options are this guy or this guy. Which would I move? The middle one. But we know the middle one, but why? Oh. Uh. Can I move this guy? No, you can't. Not even allowed to move him. <laughs> and you moved already the small one, so you have to move the middle one. If the top, but we have to make this a little generic. If the top disk of one of our towers is the biggest disk, what does that mean? One more time. If the top disk of one of our towers... We can't move it. There is no place he can legally go other than an empty tower. Yep. But in this case, we know there will not be an empty tower. Uh -huh. Well, that's not actually true. There's no place we can move him other than an empty tower. Right? Okay. Should we ever move something to an empty tower? There's plenty of situations where we move somebody from an empty tower. So, why did we choose the middle guy versus the last guy? Because... We are using the like, smaller disc uh, on the top of the bigger. Yeah, the, the small one cannot go into the top of the biggest one. Right. Correct. So is, the second rule is that you cannot move the big disc into the like a not empty tower. So you cannot move the biggest disc into the filled tower with the discs. There is no empty tower. So you well, have to choose the middle one. We only have two legal moves we can make here. Yeah, like we are using like n minus one moves. So if we already did the moves in number uh, one, two, two, so which we already done, so we have to use the other other tower into the this two. The last move I made was this little disc yeah, like from the middle one to the left, right? Yeah. So I know this is not my next move. So my next possible moves are this guy and this guy. Now we're going to use this guy as our move. Why? Well, it's the only legal move. I cannot move this guy anywhere else. Can I? Cannot move him anywhere else. So I can't move this guy. So my only choice is to move this guy. Where can I move this guy? To the only place that I can move them. Now, I can't move something from here because that's where I just moved. I can't move something from here because there's nothing there. Can I move something from here? Yes. Where do I move him? Why? I can move him here? Okay, yeah, you can move the, yeah. Nothing keeps you from moving him right here? Yeah, but we already used that move. 
uh, to tell it sweet. So we can't use. No, the small one can move into the empty one. Uh, well, uh, he's, he's. Would we ever remove from the same tower twice in a row? No, we can't. So you're going to say that's another rule. Uh, yeah, so this we cannot we remove from the same tower two times in a row. Start? Huh? Then how we can start? We have to move from the bucket first, uh, bucket ah. zero, to the bucket three. Yeah, uh, can't, bucket two in a can't even start the game with yeah. that rule, can we? we can. Yeah, we can do, but we are not using here. Like, we are not using the same mode two times from the same tower. So just, we are using once. If you use one, so that you can't move uh, from the same tower. Well, but, but then that means that I should, that I could technically take this guy and move him here instead of moving him here. Yeah, we can do, but you know, we are, we are increasing the steps. I agree, but we have to have an algorithmic reason for moving it to the last tower than the middle tower. What's that reason? Other than the fact that we know it's the smart thing to do. <laughs> Again, we're proving how good at problem solving we are. We can't even explain why something's the right answer, even though we know it's the right answer. I can easily move this guy from here to here. Perfectly legit. Doesn't break any of the rules we've come up with so far. Maybe we can. We have to create a rule that the main idea to fill the last bucket, not the empty bucket. So always move towards the last bucket if you can. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Whenever you have a move that legally can go to the last bucket, do it. Do it. Yeah, that, that one. You, you, yeah. you like that one? Yeah. Okay. So this is our only move we can make. So we're going to go from that guy, and we're going to go to two. We have our winner, right? All right. So let's go back and try our rules again. So, we come off this stack. This is our only move we can make, right? Only place where discs are. Now, the last bucket's open. Can we legally make a move here? Yes. We can't. So, you want it. All right? So, we rephrased our original thing where we said, oh, well, try to move to the last bucket if you can. We've rephrased that and say, if the last bucket is available and we can legally move there, go there. Not try. Do it. All right? So... We're going to go from 0 to 2. <coughs> we cannot move to where we just pushed, or from where we just pushed. We cannot move from here. Only legal starting point is here. Where are we going to put this guy? The only legal place we can put him. Right? 0 to 1. We can't move from here, so we can either choose here or here. Well, if we pick this guy, can we move him? No. no. No place we can put him. Can we move this guy? Yes. Yes. Where do I put him? We have to create the rule to put on the... We already had a rule. Exactly. The rule says never put the smallest one on top of the biggest one. Yes, that one. Right? So we're going to move this guy because we can't move this guy. And the rule says never put the smallest one on top of the biggest one. So we're going to put the smallest one on top of the one that's not the biggest one. So we're going to say 2 to 1. Can't move from here because we just did that move. Can't move from here because there's no moves. Can we move from here? Yes. Is it a legal move to move him to the end? Yes. Always go to the end if you can. So we'll go 0 to 2. Okay? Can't move from here. We just made that move. Can't move from here. There's no moves to make. Can we move from here? Yep. Where should we move him? To 0. There is like possible, any possible. Uh, ah, I'm going to try to move him to the last bucket because it's legal, but I can't put him on top of the largest disc. Yeah. Not allowed. So my inclination was to put him here, but that breaks one of my other rules. Yeah. Therefore, I'm going to put him the only other place he can go. Bucket one to bucket zero. I can't move here. I can't move here. This guy won't go anywhere, right? Well, 
Yes, he's already in place, but we also can't move him. There's literally no place he can go. Can I move this guy? Yes. yes. Where do I put him? Always try to go to the last bucket if you can. So, we're going to go from bucket one to bucket two. Now we're going to move this guy. Always go to the last bucket if you can. Does it break my rule of putting the smallest guy on top of the biggest guy? Nope. So we'll go to zero, two, two. And there's our answer. Now, that algorithm we just came up with works for three disks, three towers. When you start getting into more disks and or more towers, then you have to start working with whether or not there's an even or odd number of disks and towers, so the algorithm actually gets more complex. There is an algorithm, though, for solving this. Um, in our algorithms class, we usually write something that goes along the lines of um, be able to create any number of towers and any number of disks and have it auto-solve and tell you the number of moves it took. It's kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, for that, we can use a recursive algorithm. Oh, well, I don't know if you'd use recursive algorithms. You'd run out of memory pretty quick, especially if there's lots of towers and lots of disks. So you'd have to use an algorithm similarly to what we just came up with, but it's a little bit more complex. You know, some of the parts are still there, like, oh, always try to move to the last guy if we can. But some of the rules start going, where do we start our move? If we have an even number of disks, start or move on an odd number tower, that kind of stuff. Okay, so it, the algorithm gets more complex as you get more general. But in this case, because we're only dealing with a fixed number of towers and a fixed number of disks, we know exactly what the correct way of doing it is. There's only one way to accurately do this in the minimum number of moves because of the nature of the problem. That makes sense? Okay, questions about any of that? Yeah, if you're using full disk and uh, three tower, it could be the same problem. Uh, so, like, how many moves we can get? Yes, yeah. I think it's 16. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we did with like three tower and uh, three uh, three disks. So, if you had a four disk and three tower. So okay. And, uh, yeah, yeah, like I'm, so, if we reset this, if we take this up to four, four yeah. this guy. Well, let's follow our rules. I actually think that's the wrong move because there was an even number of disks. Yeah. So you have we'll see. Let me reset this. Because there's an even number of disks, we're going to move it to tower one. I believe this is the right way of doing it. Then we'll go here. Then we'll go here. Then we'll go here. Now, you're going to see a rule break right off the bat. I'm going to put the littlest disk on top of the big one. I believe that's the minimum number of moves. Yep, yep moves 15, minimum was 15. And that had to do with even odd. That make sense? That's why I chose the odd tower rather than the even tower to move it to. So if we start that again, we go to five disks. Now that it's odd, this is the correct first move. Then this, then this, then this, then this, then this. I messed up by one. Oh, we're good.
31, 31. Right. That makes sense? So that starting move has to deal with whether or not we have an even or an odd number of discs. That tells us whether we move to the center or to the other one. And then the rest of the rules kind of play in the way we wrote them, except that rule of never put the small disc on top of the biggest disc is not always true. Make sense? So if we went a little farther with this, we can come up with a generalistic algorithm where we kind of get the point. You know, so a couple different points we drove home there. First of all, a stack does not need to be implemented using a linked list. Stacks and linked lists are not related. A stack is a way to solve a problem using push pops and peaks. A common way to implement stacks is with a linked list if we don't know how many elements are going to be in a stack. But an array version of a linked list is every bit as reasonable if we do know how many elements are going to be in the stack. So that's the first thing we learned today, right? Well, you first learned recursion because you didn't know what recursion was. All right, so big, big deal there disconnect this idea of linked lists versus stacks. It really goes back to that idea of we can build a house with wood or with brick. They both have their viable reasons. Okay? <coughs> Secondly, um, we re-emphasize this idea that human beings are very good at solving problems. Even with it staring us right in the face, we knew what the right next move was, but we didn't know why. Interesting, right? There's the, the, the proof is in the pudding. Yeah. Pun intended. Okay, let's take about a 13-minute break. We'll come back at uh, 5 after 8, and we'll pick up where we left off. This is a, we're at a good breaking point.